good to see everybody back, and uh, we're going to continue right on where we just left off in our last program in Philippians chapter 3, and uh, we're down to about verse 10. <coughs> Again, we uh, are real proud of the fact, I guess that's the way they put it in Oklahoma, I don't like that word proud, but uh, I guess I should say thrilled with our visitors from out of state today, and uh, we just trust that maybe you can find your way back. In fact, Paul's already said you're coming back in December, aren't you? Paul's coming back in December. Shirley? <laughs> well, anyway, we're, we're just glad to have everybody as well as all of those of you from around eastern Oklahoma. And again, for those of you out on television, if you'd ever like to join us for a taping session, we usually tape the first Wednesday or the Wednesday of the first full week. Of, uh, of the month. So if you happen to be coming through Tulsa, why uh, you call us and we'll give you instructions how to get here. One of these days they're going to have our new studio ready here at Channel 47. They're uh, working on it out there. So for those of you in television, if all of a sudden someday you see us in new facilities, it's not mine, it's not Les Feldick Ministries, it's Channel 47's. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to go back there before too much longer and we can have our tables again as we had years back. <clears throat> okay, remember, all of our past programs are available in uh, videotape. We put 12 programs on one six-hour video, and then that's been dubbed over onto six hours of audio cassette, and it's been transcribed then by Jerry and his good wife, Lorna, uh, into a 12-lesson little booklet, and uh, you can have your choice or take all three. A lot of people do. They, they have various ways of using them. So if you're interested in any of those materials, you... Uh, Call us or write to us and we'll get the information to you. Okay, I think that's all of our announcements so far as this is concerned, and we'll jump right back to where we left off, Philippians chapter 3, and I didn't really finish my thoughts on verse 10, that I may know Him. Now that's the, the joy and the hope and the security of every believer, that we can know Him. He's not just some strange God way out there someplace, but we know Him. You know, whenever I read this verse, I have to think of a little anecdote I read years and years ago, and I'm sure most of you have probably heard it or read it, of the young lady who was attending a university, and somebody gave her a book to read, and she tried and tried to get interested in it and never could. She'd read the first chapter and put it up. And uh, a few weeks later, she'd try again, and she could never get in, so finally she just put it up on her bookshelf and forgot about it. But uh, by the time she was a senior at the university, she had fallen in love with one of her professors. Turned out that he was the author of this book. And then all of a sudden, she just couldn't devour it enough, and her roommate, who had been with her from her early freshman days, says, well, what in the world? I thought that was the book you could never get interested in. She says, it is. She says, then why are you reading it now? Because she says, I've fallen in love with the author. <laughs> well, you see, that's the secret. When you fall in love with Christ, you cannot exhaust this book. It is just unfathomable. And you'll just keep seeing new things pop up all the time. And you think, well, now why didn't I see this before? Well, you see, God, just like he told Israel when they went into the land of milk and honey, or they could have gone in, he says, I won't drive them all out at once. I'll drive the Canaanites out just fast enough so that you can absorb it and you can take over the land. Well, that's what he does with the scripture. See, he doesn't unload it all on us at once. It, it just keeps coming and coming. And uh, my, I could just go for another half hour showing you verses that I never saw until maybe within the last year or two. And uh, I know there's going to be more coming. I, I just know it. So anyway, we get to the place where we know him. He's personal. He's close to us. He knows all about us. And, of course, when we come into that kind of a relationship with Christ, we're also going to suffer with Him. Now, again, I've said so often, we in America know very little of suffering for our faith. It could happen yet. We hope it won't, but it could. But remember that during 90% of Christendom's history, believers suffered for their faith. They were persecuted. They were driven from valley to valley. And uh, their homes and their villages just utterly uprooted and destroyed simply because they were Christians. And uh, this, of course, is what Paul said. In fact, another verse comes to mind. Go all the way back to Romans. Romans chapter 8.
Romans chapter 8. We were just talking about, you know, what's going to be our lot for eternity. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us an awful lot. It really doesn't. Uh, about the only verse we've got is that uh, Paul writes in Corinthians 2 verse 9. I'll never forget when Luann held it up for me and I didn't see it. I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And that's about as much as we've got. We know there's a glorious situation, but just how we're going to function, what we're going to do. But these verses at least give us a little hint. In Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. Romans 8, beginning at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons or the children of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. See, we don't live under constant fear that we're breaking God's law or something like that. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That relationship again. See, we're in Christ. He's dear to us, and we're dear to Him. Then verse 16, the Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now here it comes. If we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now that's as far as we can go. That's going to be something. That everything that he has prepared or is preparing for eternity that's his, is going to be ours. That's what joint heirship is about. Now that's beyond human understanding, isn't it? That's part of, again, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, keep going. If so be that we suffer with him, see? Now a lot of people say, oh, I'll take the good stuff, but I don't want that bad. Well, no, that all goes in the same, the same program. We may have some suffering to do. And so we're joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. Now if we suffer with him, that we may also be what? Glorified with him or together. And so this is our prospect. And the world may think we're crazy. They may think we're a bunch of kooks, but I got news for them. It's just like when the philosophers of Athens thought that Paul was nothing but a babbler. They had all the real stuff, and he was just a babbler, but history has proven that when you go to Mars Hill, there's a huge bronze plaque in memory of the Apostle Paul. Not a single philosopher is mentioned. And so in reality, who were the babblers? Well, the philosophers, see? Who had the truth? The babbler. Well, okay, Philippians chapter 3. So the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his what? Death. Now, we don't like the word death, do we? I don't. We all hate it. A pet can die, and it tears us up. A loved one, and it just tears us up. And we are programmed to just literally despise death. But the bright side of the coin is that out of death, for us as believers, comes what? Life. And that's the, problem. that's the process. There has to be death in order for life to appear. It, it shows in every seed that's planted. It has to die for a new blade of grass to appear. All right, now same way here. We have to be made conformable to his death before we can partake of his death. Life. Now again, go back to Romans. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're, we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture whenever possible. Romans chapter 6. See, all of these basic doctrines that flow from the pen of this apostle will always dovetail together. It's the best <coughs> word I can find for it. They all fit. Romans chapter 6. Starting at verse 5. For if we have been... What? Planted. Now, where do you plant things? Well, in the ground. Now, I'm going to be right up front. I get letter after letter asking me about cremation. Well, I can't quote a scripture that absolutely forbids it. But I think that in language, it flies in the face of scripture. 
because the whole idea, at least for the believer, the whole idea of placing our loved one in the earth is that they're only there waiting for resurrection day. And here again, the concept is of a seed planted in the earth, not burned, not reduced to ashes, but it's planted. And as soon as it's planted, the seeds of resurrection begin, see? All right, now Paul uses that same analogy, that if we have been planted, literally put to death together in the likeness of his death. Now you see, Philippians use the word conformable. Here the word is likeness, but I can't see in Nichols where the difference between the two because it's still identifying us with his death. And there can be no life until there is death. All right, reading on in Romans 6. Knowing this, that our old man, our old Adamic nature, that part of us that came by virtue of our physical birth, that our old man is what? Crucified. And what does crucifixion do? It kills, see? And so we've been put to death by our faith being identified with him. So read it again in the scripture, knowing this, that our old man is crucified, put to death with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed or put out of commission, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is what? Free. See? Now, we got another analogy right across the page in Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. And this is a Pauline doctrine that death brings new life. But we can't have new life until we've died to the old nature. Romans 7. Oh, goodness. I guess I'll take time to read them all, starting at verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them who know the law, how that the law, the civil law, hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. As long as he liveth. What does that mean? That when he dies, that law ends its authority. All right? For the woman who hath a husband is bound by the law. That is the civil law. She's bound to her husband so long as he liveth. But... If the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law. Naturally. We have no problem with that. If a spouse dies, then there is no law to forbid the living partner to remarry. Scripture doesn't forbid it. Because death ends that relationship. All right, verse 3. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress, because it was not ended by death. But... If her husband is dead, she is free from that law. And if she remarries, she is not an adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, why does Paul put this in here? To show us a doctrinal statement. And here it is. Wherefore, brethren, you also are become dead to the law, that is the mosaic system, by the body of Christ. Well, what happened to the body of Christ? It died. Death is what broke that stranglehold of legalism on the human being. All right? So you are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married, a union, if you please, to another. Well, not to another man, not to another woman, but to whom? Christ. Even to Christ, see, to him who is raised from the dead. And why are we united to Christ in resurrection power? That we should bring forth what? Fruit. Now, in a marriage relationship, what is fruit? Children. In this spiritual relationship, what is to be our fruit? Soul winning. See, we're to win the lost. That's why God left us here. We're to be a testimony of His grace. Now, not everybody can, can be one like someone else. We're not robots. We're not all identically alike. But 
there should be that desire on the part of every believer to see lost people saved. Because the mind of God has now been imparted to us, and the mind of God is that he's not willing that any should perish. See? And so this should be our, our driving desire that we might see lost people saved. And I'll never forget when we were in Charlotte this summer. A whole black family, and I just shared this with some black folk again the other night. I, I know we have a tremendous black audience across America. Well, this black family comprised of a husband and a wife and two grown sons and their wives and their kids. And we got out there and the first thing they shared was that that whole family had been saved through our program. Well, I'll tell you what, that just makes your day, see? Makes your day, because that's why we're here. And when we left, my Steve came to the car and tears running down his cheek. And he said, now Les, don't you forget, you have changed this whole world for my whole family. Well, that's why we're here, see? Oh, listen, that we can bring forth fruit unto God. Well, back to Philippians. Back to Philippians, chapter 3. So we were made conformable unto death. In other words, we have died with him. We've been crucified with him. We've been resurrected with him in resurrection power. Now remember, resurrection power is what gave him victory over everything that could ever oppose. Resurrection power gave Christ victory over all the satanic forces, over all the power of hell and death, anything, everything that was ever created now becomes under his authority by virtue of his resurrection power. And that's where we walk. That's where we live and breathe and move is in that resurrection power. Oh, I could go on and on, but for sake of time, let's go on into verse 11. If, now this is not a verse that throws doubt on working our way into salvation or anything like that, but what he's driving home is that his whole heart's desire is to attain unto that resurrection body. Now, it's going to be coming up later in the chapter, isn't it? But let's go ahead and drop down to it in Philippians here, chapter 3. Verse 20 and 21. We may get to it later in the afternoon, and if not, why well, we'll pick it up next month. But here in this same chapter, verses 20 and 21, for our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven. Even though we're walking here on terra firma, our citizenship is already settled in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned or made like unto his glorious body. See, not his body of humiliation. I was reading again just the other night. A lot of people just don't realize that in his earthly ministry, Jesus, used alone, was the name of his humiliation. It was not the name that attached itself to his power and his glory. It was the name of humiliation. And as he went then in that name of Jesus as a man and suffered the horrors of the, of the cross and the death of it, then in resurrection power we now know him more as the Christ or the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is not totally appropriate to simply refer to him now in resurrection terms as simply Jesus. In fact, I think I put it on the program some time ago, and a gentleman called, and he thought he had me. And he said, I found some verses, because I had made the statement that never that I knew of did the disciples ever refer to the Lord as Jesus. They never did. They called him Master. They called him Lord. They never called him Jesus. Well, he called and he says, I've got you. And I said, well, show me the verse. Well, now wait a minute. That was using the term in the third person, not in the first. 
Oh, well, then here's one in John's Gospel. I said, now there again. That's just simply referring to him in the third person. Ah, uh, he says, you win. So he, he hung up. But always remember that the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is his appropriate term as a result of that resurrection power. He is no longer the man of Nazareth, or the man of Galilee, as the songwriters have put it, but he is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he shall change, back to the text in verse 21, he will change this vile body, that it may be fashioned under his glorious body, his resurrected body, which could go right through the wall, could go right through the ceilings. It could go from here to Pluto in a second or less. And you know what? That's what we're going to have someday. That's what we're going to have someday. It's coming. All right. And so we'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. All right. Now let's see how Paul puts that again. You'll remember we covered this way back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Almost the same kind of language again, see? And this just confirms that this is what the apostle was talking about by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, dropping down to verse 51. All got it? Behold, I show you a mystery or a secret or something that's never been revealed before in Scripture. We shall not all sleep or die physically. But since we can't go to glory in this old body, we're going to have to be what? Changed. See, and that's exactly what he's talking about in Philippians. That this vile body will be made like unto his glorious body. All right. So here it is. We shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling or the blink of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, living believers, if the Lord should come today, we shall be changed. We can't go to glory in this old body of corruptible flesh. <coughs> But if the Lord changes it, we can, and He will. All right, verse 53, For this corruptible, this body that is prone to corruption, must put on incorruption. It has to become an eternal body that will never die and never corrupt. And this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, we're going to live and rule and reign with Him for ever. And then verse 54, so when this corruptible, this body, will have put on incorruption by virtue of a sudden instant change, providing the Lord comes while we're living, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What kind of victory? Resurrection, see? And we will no longer uh, deal with this old body of flesh, but we will be transformed and translated in that split second of time. Okay, back to Philippians once again. Still in chapter 3. And so if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection out from among the dead is really a better translation than of the dead. And what do you suppose he's talking about? Well, when the believers are going to experience what I teach as the rapture, and the living ones are the ones we just talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, and then 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us so clearly that the dead in Christ will rise first, and in the next split second, we follow them in that resurrection. All right, now this is what Paul is alluding to, that I might attain to the resurrection out from among the dead. And I checked several Greek uh, dictionaries and so forth last night, and that's exactly what it, what it says. Not just the resurrection of the dead, 
but a resurrection from among the dead. In other words, not everyone is going to be resurrected at the same time. Now, let's go back to John's Gospel again. So that you'll know what I'm talking about when I say not everybody will be resurrected at the same time. <clears throat> John's Gospel, chapter 5. John's Gospel, chapter 5. Dropping down to verse 28. Now I'm repeating them a little more than usual today because I had a couple letters this last week that said I don't give the reference often enough. So uh, I'll be repeating them. John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 28. And the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry is speaking. And he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. But now here we have a separation. They're not all going to come forth at once. But they who have done good or have been believers... There's only one way of doing good in Scripture, and that's faith. All right, so people of faith will come forth unto the resurrection of life, eternal life. Then, a thousand and some years later, according to Revelation 20, then we have the resurrection of condemnation to those who have done evil or were destitute of faith. So you're separated. And then, if you remember how I taught 1 Corinthians 15, back I think even the uh, New Testament saints will be divided into three groups. The first fruits in Matthew 27, and then I think the major resurrection will be the church age in, uh, in the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, and then we've got a third group, which will be the tribulation saints in, uh, in Revelation. And so you have those three categories of New Testament believers that will come forth at that last resurrection day. And then, of course, the dead will be resurrected to go to the great white throne at, uh, at the thousand years, at the end of the thousand years, and before we go into eternity. And so always remember the resurrection of the just and the resurrection, resurrection of the lost is separated. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.